Hey everybody, so welcome to this year's Halloween episode. So today we are going to be walking through a step-by-step -step process. So if you're not familiar with graph, you can still follow along and learn a lot. If you do know a lot about graph, there are timestamps down below if you want to skip ahead. And we are going to be doing this in Neo 4 j The mini graph that we are going to be creating is all about cursed movies, or at least what Hollywood deems a cursed movie. After we get the base graph set up, I'm going to turn it over to you for your challenge associated with this video. So there is a Kaggle link down below if you want to submit your work so you can check that out. And there's also a GitHub repo down below and a lot of other resources if you want to go and check those out. So your challenge is to take the base graph and morph it into a monopartite graph. So I will walk through what are some of the decisions that you need to make during that process, but it's up to you to use your newfound skills in graph to create that monopartite graph, which means that it's got the same kind of nodes and edges. And the reason you're going to do that is because I'm going to turn it over to Claire Sullivan from Neo4j. We are tag teaming this video. So she is going to walk you through two different graph algorithms that you can use on that type of data to answer the main question of this video. And that is, is there anything to this cursed movie claim uh, from Hollywood. Are there any different characteristics really uh, between movies that are deemed cursed and those that just have unfortunate accidents associated with them? So if this sounds interesting to you, make sure you keep on watching and find out is this movie mystique or a film critique? That's for you to decide. Let's go get started. My name is Claire Sullivan. I'm a data science advocate at Neo4j, and I am here to help you out with this Kaggle challenge. Before we begin, I just want to say thank you to Ashley for inviting me and for inviting Neo4j into what's going to be a lot of fun. And today I'm going to talk about how to do a few calculations on graphs that you might find particularly useful for this challenge. And while we're at it, here's how you can reach out to me on the internet. Okay, come join us on Discord. We have set up a channel specifically for people to talk about this challenge. Next one I wanted to mention, the next resource is a video series that I've created called Bite-Sized Neo4j for Data Scientists. These are This is a series of five minute videos that's uh, designed to help data scientists get up and running with Neo4j. So you might find something useful there. Our data is coming from two different places for this challenge. The first is from Wikidata. And when we query Wikidata, we query, um, we, we get back these RDFs, Resource Description Framework Triples. And what these are, are basically nouns connected through verbs to other nouns. So our nouns in this case are Wikidata Q values. And then our verbs, we call P values. That's what Wikidata calls P values. And within Neo4j, we have a library that's, that's built in to help you uh, pull in the uh, RDF data called Neo Semantics. And this is just a really quick query that would show you how you would pull in a pre existing data set um, to create a graph within Neo4j. The other data set that we have is more hand curated to try and augment that RDF graph with more information. And this is presented in CSV files. It's pretty easy to load a CSV file to, into Neo4j. You'll see that, that query as well as all the other queries that we're using today. All right, so the very first thing we're going to do is we're going to go to sandpox.neo4j.com. So we're going to start a new project, blank sandbox create. So we're going to open up in our browser. All right. So if you get this screen, um, just refresh because your credentials are actually stored in your browser. All right. So there you go. You are now connected. So if you open up your database, there's nothing in here. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to go to the spooky movie graph. We're going to go into the cipher queries. So this first area is if you want to pick apart how the RDF was actually created with Neo Semantics, and the next part that we're going to walk through together is how do you merge the Neo Semantics wiki data with uh, your manual created data with the CSV. In my case, that's 
the cursed movie data. This area here is for the later part of the video where Claire is actually going to walk through some fun algorithms you can actually use to get more insights from graphs such as this. But there's your challenge. You have to structure this graph a little bit more on your own to get to the point where you can use some of the queries Claire is going to talk about. But we're gonna set you up to be able to do that. So let's go to the graph import. So the first thing we're going to do is we have to go through these queries in order. So we're going to grab the call, we're going to put it up here into our query and then we're gonna run it. Okay, so this is good. We see that it was successful. Okay, now let's go to the next area where we're gonna grab this, we're gonna run it. Okay, the next is where it's going to be calling the actual triples that we created or that were gathered, I should say. And I would really encourage you to go through each of these queries and analyze how they were structured so that you can learn from that yourself. So you see that this uh, went off successfully. We have almost 600 triples. Now let's keep that in mind because that's the limit we will set when we wanna view the full graph. So let's do the last part, which is actually populating with that CSV and all the other goodies that we have. And this data set, the raw data set, if you wanna try this out yourself, is over here in the Kaggle Cursed Movie and that link will be down below. Okay, so let's run this. This will maybe take a little bit of time. Okay, so now we have our graph. I'm gonna close some of these earlier uh, queries. Okay, so if we zoom out, we can see that it doesn't look like everything's there, um, but that's okay. This is actually just showing you the, the first pass at what was loaded in. So if we wanna see the full graph, going to do our match on all nodes and return on all nodes. So this little N tells me the node and it means all nodes. All right, so I'm gonna close this first one because it's a little messy. So let's expand this to look at it. So this is our full graph as it is right now. So you can see that there's these clusters that are surrounding the film. So you can see the films are, are in red and the lines are actually telling you how they are related. And you can see that down in the lower left corner. So this is country of origin. So the Alamo country of origin is the United States. And so you can start to see how these clusters around the movies start to interact. And that's in this middle part. So let's zoom into that a little bit more. A valuable thing to understand when creating and working with graph is you have to have some basic functions that you know how to do. So the first is creating a new node. Another is creating a relationship. And I would say another good one to know is how do you delete something if you find some errors? So I'm going to walk you through those so that you can start to build out your by graph and then you can move on to the more accelerated part of the video that Claire is going to go over. So the first thing that you might notice, and this is where your challenge is going to come into play, is when we loaded that CSV, sometimes, Poltergeist, for instance, over here is the wiki Poltergeist, and this one was just a string in the CSV. So you can see that when it was parsed, it got a little confused. So one thing you can do is actually take these relationships that are connected to Poltergeist, the dummy node, and remap them to the true Poltergeist. So let's see how that would happen. Okay, so what I'm doing here is I am just giving a label to what I want the match to use. And I'm going to say F for a resource because in this case, the resource is uh, Poltergeist, the one that we don't want. And that's the one that has 1982, right? The one we do want only says Poltergeist. So you can see that I am going to be mapping skeleton, which is right now connected to the dummy. I wanna map it to the real film. So I have labeled the resource. The name is Poltergeist. 
And the resource that I want to map it to is skeleton, or I want to map skeleton to poltergeist, I should say. And the relationship, I have labeled this as you for used, and used is my relationship. So let's go ahead and run that. And you can see that it was successful. Now to see that in the view down here, we just refresh and we zoom out and we look for poltergeist. So you can see here, skeleton is still connected to the old poltergeist the dummy poltergeist. That's okay, because what we're trying to do is we're trying to take all of the good connections to the dummy and map them to this real poltergeist so that we can just delete this. So your task is to continue to take all the other nodes that are connected to the dummy poltergeist and remap them to this poltergeist using the query that we just walked through, which looks like this. So in this case, you're going to have to take the other nodes and replace this with the node uh, name. And then you're going to have to update what relationship you want to map. So do that for all of the connections to the dummy poltergeist. Once you do that, we're going to delete the dummy poltergeist. And here's how you do that. Okay, so you can see here, I named this resource dummy because it's not the right poltergeist that we want to use. And it's going to delete this exact one that I am mentioning. So let's go ahead and run that. It says it was completed, close this. So let's zoom out. And you can see there is no longer a connection to Poltergeist that is a dummy node. You have this one node called Cursed. So maybe instead of having a node, all of your data is in one category of Cursed and the other category is non-cursed. So how would you go about making a new node to help represent that? You might wanna create uh, some new nodes. So let's walk through how to do that. Here, I am going to be creating a bigraph resource and I'm going to be calling this thing not cursed. So you can see that was successful. So let's check out, did it actually get created? can see here not cursed was created so that's good now we can actually start to connect things to not cursed because remember we already have cursed here so all the movies that are technically considered cursed are mapped to this node now let's map some things to not cursed so Le Mans is not technically considered cursed by Hollywood so let's go ahead and represent that so let's walk through this query I am pointing to the film Le Mans and I am going to be connecting this resource called not curse that we just created. I'm going to create a relationship between them called has quality. Okay, so it went successfully. Let's refresh. Okay, so now you can see Le Mans and it is now connected to not cursed. All right, so now that we've gone over some of the basic functions that you can do while you have this base graph, we are now going to talk about how do you structure this graph in a way that will help you run some more sophisticated queries or algorithms on it. So in the case of what Claire is going to go over later in this video is we are going to have to create a monopartite graph or a homogeneous graph. So in order to do that, it means that all of the nodes will have to be the same type as well as the same type of relations. So as you can see here, we have quite a number of types of nodes and we have quite a number of relations. So the way that I would go about, and this is your challenge, so you have to think through how you would take this graph and structure it in a way that will make a monopartite graph in order to do Claire's portion of the video. So. The question we are trying to resolve, is there any merit to Hollywood's claims of certain movies being cursed while others are not? Both seem to have tragedies associated with them, and yet only some of them have a curse title to them while others do not. 
So the first thing that I would do is I would look at the different types of relations that we have. Which one of these might be useful to answering my question? So I can see first which relationships are the most prominent. And I can clearly see cast member. There are a ton of cast members. So I have to ask myself, are these going to be useful to help me answer my question? And while a lot of these tragedies are happening to cast members, not all cast members are important to, be, to answer this question. So that one might not be what I'm looking for. A few others that I see here are cause of death. That certainly would be a helpful one to look at, as well as number of deaths and number of injured. So these are going to be the relationships that are candidates for my monopartite graph. Now the next portion I have to think through is, well, what kind of node would be useful in this scenario? So one way to do this is to explore the relationships as they are today. Now the nice thing about Neo Forget is some of these queries can be automatically generated. So if I'm literally just looking for all of the nodes that are connected with significant event, well, that seems like there's a lot of relationships and significant events probably are notable, maybe picking up by the media and Hollywood. So let's look at those. Now you can see I just clicked on this and Neo4j has actually created the query for me where it's basically returning anything that matches a relationship of significant event. So I can see that the Alamo and the Shining both are showing up already. And that's because they have a direct relationship with significant event to the actual type. So here, these are resources. So I might need to go in and reclassify what kind of node these are because resources is kind of generic. Now, I also see a lot of persons on this. So perhaps I need to understand when there is a relationship between a person and what I would reclassify that is resources now, maybe I say it is the significant event. That might be the updates I need to make to my graph in order to answer the question. Another option I have is maybe I only need to understand when a film has a significant event related to a person. Maybe the person is going to be the connection between all of these. So one way I would go about researching this is I would look at right now the significant events that seem to have a few different connections to them. So we can see burn is something that is happening to two different people. So let's expand both of these to see what movie is associated. And what do you know? It's actually the same movie. So that's a really interesting finding. Now, if I was doing more sophisticated graph queries, this is only one hop away from my original understanding, which is Margaret Hamilton and a burn. So this is one hop, burn, and The Wizard of Oz is basically two hops. One, two. So how can I make that more clear so that I can run more sophisticated algorithms on this later on. Those are the types of questions that you will be asking yourself while you go through this challenge of creating a monopartide graph and then later running two different types of graph algorithms on this data set. Or if you want to use some additional data science tools, stay tuned. Claire is going to be going over exactly how you can do that. Uh, we're going to look at two algorithms here. One is called betweenness centrality. The other is called local clustering coefficient. And here's kind of how we think about betweenness centrality. We look at which nodes are on the shortest path to which other nodes the most. Now, the way I like to explain this is think about your office and you've got the big boss person at the office and you wanna to talk to them, but you can't just go and say, hey, I want a meeting. Um, you might go to one friend and another friend and then a colleague and maybe they can get you in kind of thing, but that's not very efficient. 
The more efficient way would be to contact the administrative assistant of the big boss person who can hook you up. Now, a lot of people talk to that same person to get meetings with the big boss person. So that administrative assistant would have a very high between this centrality because they are the short track to get to the big boss person. The other one I want to mention is local clustering coefficient. What this does is it looks at triangles within the graph to try and identify small communities there. So if I look at the left, I have a graph that has one central node and all of the other nodes connected to it, but they're not connected to each other. So I have no triangles in that graph. And that would mean that we have a clustering coefficient of zero. Whereas if we contrast that with the other side on the right side of the screen here, all of our nodes are connected to each other. We've got a ton of triangles there. And so the clustering coefficient, because they're all connected to each other, is one. So clustering coefficient is a great way at identifying small communities within your graph. Now, you might want to learn more about these things, and I highly recommend you go download this book. It's a graph algorithms book, um, and it's for free. It talks about how to do all of these calculations and many more within both Neo4j and Apache Spark, if that's your thing. So go pick up a copy. We are going to be using this thing called the Graph Data Science Library or GDS Library. GDS um, has all of these things that you need built in. Um, and this here is just a link to the documentation. It has between the centrality built in. So this is like the doc page from there. One of the things you'll notice are these boxes here that um, the algorithm runs on directed or undirected graphs, but it requires a homogeneous graph. We also call that like a monopartite graph. Um, we'll talk about what that means here in just a second. The other algorithm, local clustering coefficient, you see it wants an undirected and homogeneous graph. So let's keep that in mind here as we look at what that might mean. If we're talking about monopartite, undirected, unweighted graphs, basically what we're talking about is all of the nodes and all of the relationships are the same type. You'll find that the GDS library prefers to have graphs in that format. So just keeping that in mind, um, we're gonna try and tr structure our graph that way. I will tell you that I'm gonna be running this on a sample graph that already is set up this way, but you might need to figure out how to set your graph on the spooky movies up that way on what we call sandbox, the, the Neo4j sandbox. So that's just sandbox.neo4j.com. And um, you're going to want to create a blank database. So what I would do for that is I would click on this new project button and I would select blank sandbox. I'm not going to do that right now because I'm going to use a pre-populated database. It's the graph data science database. OK, so I've created that database. I'm going to click open. And what that does is it brings us to what we call the browser. Here's the browser. And if you don't get this right away, just click refresh. It might ask you for a password, in which case come over here to connection details. The username is always Neo4j and here's the password there. You just copy and paste them in. Okay, and so what I have here is I have a free database running right now. Um, there's this guide right here. You can click through this and you can learn how to use Neo4j and the graph data science library, which is really cool. Now I'll tell you what this graph is. This is a graph of Game of Thrones, the books, the first five books. And we have all kinds of different relationships and people and places. So I'm just going to run this really quick query where I'm going to match all nodes and return all nodes. Um, don't worry about learning these queries right now because um, in the repository, there's a link where you can uh, go learn how to use Cypher. If you know SQL, you'll find it rather similar. Cypher and SQL, Cypher is kind of like making ASCII art out of SQL. Okay, so I have a whole bunch of people here, which the people are kind of the light blue color, and I've got orange, which, which is battles. I've got, I'm not going to say dead people in dark blue because I don't want to give anything away. Um, I've got houses in red. So, so yeah, I've got this Game of Thrones graph, and it's cool. I can look at my node labels on the left here. Those are the things that are all colored, book uh, culture, dead, house, king, etc. I also have my relationship types. Now, remember, I wanted to look at a graph that is um, homogeneous. So I want to be looking at specifically people. Um, I'm going to have like some variable n1 that I say is a person. And I'm going to say that person interacts, that's my relationship type, with another person, n2 person. 
and I'm going to return N1 and N2. Okay, so we'll just give that a run. Okay, and so I now have, um, I have people here and you see I have, people can have multiple types of labels such as, you know, king, knight, dead, et cetera. Okay, but, but that's all cool. I have, I have a monopartite graph here. Okay, probably a good idea to close these visualization windows. They can make things slow down a bit. Um, but if worse comes to worse, just refresh the browser. Now, the first thing we're gonna need to do um, if we're gonna run GDS is we have to create this thing called an in-memory graph. And what an in-memory graph does is it creates a subgraph um, in a very efficient way that we can run calculations on. Let me show you what that looks like. Okay, so I've got this function. And again, these queries are in the repository. So I've got call GDS graph create. Now, the first, the first thing that I do is I give it a name. So I'm just gonna call it interactions. Then I'm gonna specify my nodes. So I'm gonna go for all person nodes. Then I specify my relationships. I'm gonna go for all interacts relationships, but I'm gonna specify that I want my orientation to be undirected. And that's because we know that GDS tends to prefer undirected uh, graphs. Okay, so now I have my in-memory graph created here. Um, and that's gonna be the basis for all of our calculations is that in-memory graph. So. I am now going to run betweenness centrality. Now GDS has great docs and they will be linked in the repo as well, but just really quickly, all I have to do is run GDS betweenness. And then there's this thing called stream. And what stream means is write it back to the screen. If I wanna write it to the nodes themselves, I just replace the word stream with write. But just for the sake of demonstration, we're gonna use stream. And I can see who has my highest betweenness scores. If you know Game of Thrones, these names shouldn't be a surprise. Jon Snow, Tyrion Lannister, Daenerys Targaryen, these are some of the big characters within uh, the book series. Okay, let's look at local, local clustering coefficient. It's actually a pretty straightforward uh, thing to do. So um, it's just GDS local clustering coefficient. Um, one of the things I want to point out here, when we return things um, from this query, um, these in-memory graphs, they create these node IDs that don't correspond to anything that we might recognize. So we have to bring them out of that space into our, our real space. So those node IDs, they have a property called name. I'm just going to rename it as name, and then I get my local clustering coefficient. OK, that's cool. So let's run that. Okay, so local clustering, I have a whole bunch of answers here. You gotta do some thinking about, um, about this, what this means and why it might make sense. Um, but, but those are how you run those two different queries on our in-memory graph. And as I showed before, when you're done with your in-memory graph, it's a good idea to free up some memory um, via GDS graph drop, and then the name of the graph. Okay. There we go. Um, at this point, I just do want to say thank you again. Um, this is how you can find me on Twitter. Again, thank you, Ashley. Um, and just come reach out to us um, in Discord if you want to chat about this stuff or learn more, have questions. I look forward to hearing what you all come up with, and we'll see you later.